Welcome back to DAMFEST Europe 2023. For the final session of the day, I'll hand back to your conference chair, Clemency Wright. Clemency, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Yes, so the grand finale, um, I'm really pleased to introduce to you Fabiana Batisiotti. Um, I've met Fabiana online. It's absolutely wonderful to hear her speak live today. And her topic is ensuring governance of digital assets for long term access at LSE, London School of Economics. Fabiana is a digital asset manager at LSE. And please continue to put all your questions and comments in uh, below, and we'll pick those up at the end of the session in the Q&A. Thank you. Over to you, Fabiana. Thank you, Clemency. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm the last in the bill uh, and uh, high pressure to keep everybody, everyone awake. Um, I will start with this. Um, for those, for the benefits of those who doesn't know um, LSE, um, we are the London School of Economics and Political Science, located in the heart of London. We are uh, leading worldwide uh, higher education dedicated for humanities. The LSE Library, where I work, is formally known as the British Library of Political and Economic Science, and it is one of the five uh, national research libraries in the UK. And we uh, join ranks with the British Library, the Oxford University, the Cambridge University, and the John Rylands University in Manchester. And jointly, we have a responsibility to make a significant and essential contribution to the national research base. Um, but on top of the national responsibilities that we have, we also serve our LSE community, our research, our academic, our students, and also the wider community. Like other research libraries, we hold publications, archival and special collections, we provide access to databases and many other resources and services. The library has been expanding the use of archives and special collections in teaching and learning, particularly in the last few years with the pandemic. For those that we have been investigating, sorry, we have been investing in the growing and growing our, research, uh, our resources in the digital format. We have been acquiring more digital um, archives and digitizing hundreds of thousands of pages of publications and archives. Um, but I realize that is nothing compared with what Dominic mentioned today. In the last year, uh, in the last four years, we increased our digital holdings uh, by a third, reaching almost 40 terabytes. In collaboration with the other teams, I'm responsible to manage these assets, um, which leads me to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, so I work in the digital library team and I coordinate digitization projects by orchestrating curation, catalogers, and photographers. Uh, I own our DAM account and am responsible for the digital library, which is, is our front end of our DAM uh, and provides public access to our collections. I am a qualified archivist and have been working my, in this role for about five years, but in the field for about 12 years. But let's enough of me. And let's talk about our collections. Um, so we, the, the, the body of our collections charts the profound impact of movements that helped uh, to shape the world today, focusing on the work of activists, organizations, campaigning politicians and pressure groups. These collections cover a wide range of people, events, movements, and shows the methods used to influence public debate and policy, but also shows uh, behind the scenes uh, and the winner works of these organizations and people. Some of the collection's main strengths are highlighted on the slides. We have the women's suffrage movement, uh, peace internationalism, campaign for LGBT plus rights, and our flagship um, co collection, um, is the 
Charles Booth's inquiry into poverty in London in the 19th century uh, and his most uh, maps, uh, each one, one of them is, is part of the background here uh, in, my, in my video. We also have um, material from the EU referendum in 1976 when the UK joined the common market and the Brexit, the famous or famous, depends where I come from. Um, and uh, on, on the slides, this is one of the favor uh, was one leaflet from the Fabian Society, um, known as one of the first think tanks in the world. Um, so all of these coll digital collections include born digital material acquired by the archives and special collections team. These are from external donations and acquisitions. We also look after the LSE institutional archives and artifacts and digital assets produced by our ongoing digitization program. We digitize analog collections, including rare books, collections of leaflets, posters, documents, photographs, um, tapes, and so on. All the above create a pool of digital assets which cover textual files, images, PDF, recordings, and audio text files, audio files, documentary, and data from databases. I'll talk about governance in a minute. But I wanted to point out that material without restrictions uh, is made freely available to the public primarily via our digital library. And a couple of snapshots uh, are in these slides. But we also make things available uh, in the Google Arts and Culture, Flickr, Unsplash, Gesture, uh, History Ping, YouTube and our own LSC library uh, website and social media channels. So I suppose I'm not new to say about to talk about governance today, uh, but I hope I will bring a different lens to it um, in addition to what other uh, speakers said. Um, so managing digital assets are multifaceted, especially if you add long-term preservation and open access to the, to the bucket. But what I mean by multifaceted, I'm probably stating the obvious here for this audience, but it is always very helpful to take a step back and to reflect and revisit these questions. So one, perhaps the, the first facet is what I managed, uh, is that we manage multiple formats and different formats require slightly different requirements. Um, we managed at scale, uh, remember my four terabytes um, and it's still growing. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not all I have. Uh, so I need to cater for the future as well. Born digital assets require digital preservation. Uh, digital assets are created from highly professionally digitization methods, and so the investment is really high. There are way too many dissemination risks to consider when publishing digital assets online. And, oh, sorry. Um, and so all of this adds to the bucket and making things uh, multifaceted and difficult to, to manage. Um, but without uh, good enough digital assets, good enough digital assets housekeeping, um, it leads to the sort of uh, scenario where everything is messy and nobody finds anything. So instead of governance, I prefer to use a term that I heard somewhere, and I can't say I was the one that invented this, but I use digital assets housekeeping. And my elevator pitch, is something like good enough digital housekeeping provides the right conditions to find the right digital assets with minimal effort and, arrive, and allow the right uh, reuse for, of them. Um, and this good enough um, digital asset housekeeping requires some strategy, planning, consistency application, and periodical revision. Good enough um, is reliant on technology and up-to-date skills. So the goals of my 
institution and my audience requires me to manage our digital assets for immediate use, but also for long-term use. This means that those assets are likely to overlive my own life or my own time in my organization. And the systems or whatever technology that supports them at the moment. And that leads me to talk about digital preservation. Um, and I think uh, I, I think the best the best way to start this is to get back to a definition. Um, and I'm using the digital preservation coalition definition that digital preservation refers to series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as necessary. In other words, um, it refers to all the actions needed required to maintain access to digital materials beyond the limits of media failure or technological or organiza organizational change. And what I mean by managed activities then, um, and there are uh, capabilities at LSE necessary to manage all digital assets well. Uh, I could lecture for you for hours on this, but I thought I would use a cheat sheet here uh, from the DPC. And they have developed a uh, rapid assessment model and in, in this model, they, inter, they um, talk about 11 capabilities, 11 managed activities. Um, and these are, for example, organizational capabilities and service capabilities, or you can say tech capabilities. Um, so I start using this model to see where I am with the maturity level of my governance, my managed activities about three years ago. And I totally recommend to anyone managing digital assets. Um, so the organization capabilities are also known as senior management by in or having our priorities on the management board agenda. At LSC, I am fortunate to have senior management support, but it doesn't mean that I need to continue uh, that I need to continue advocating for these capabilities. Um, if I don't keep, you know, knocking doors, they're not going to keep resources I need. So having the buy-in buy -in from senior management certainly helped me to get the senior management of IT uh, team on board too, and you need them, right? And when I need boy, I need to speak their language and be clear of my requirements. So I need to know exactly where I am, what my with them. And who has time to uh, for writing policy and guides? But honestly, if you don't spend time drafting some blurbs here, you cannot empower yourself or your teams to get your job done. Writing uh, white papers uh, sounds like 20th century, but I did, and they provided me with the framework I can uh, and need uh, to make the operational decisions and to keep consistency across teams. Uh, also think about business continuity here. Um, it is for the good for my organizations um, that I keep documentations um, uh, up to date. I can move to another job, leave England, uh, win the lottery, you know, move on. But business continuity is a really buzz word these days, uh, and it does get attention. The other two organizational capabilities is continuous improvement and community. Uh, they are to do with professional development and quite honestly, employability. Uh, working with digital assets require continue update and catch up with technology at all times. And so I try to keep myself and encourage my team and other teams to do the same. The other, the last capability, uh, organization capability that I wanted to mention um, and to delve to is um, the legal basis. And in recent year, uh, years, it became very important to me. 
Uh, so I wanted to delve into these legal bases a little bit more to show you some example of recent work uh, we have done to improve our understanding of legal, legal landscape on our digital collections. So take, take our digital library collections uh, and this image, image uh, expresses a convoluted landscape of risks to make them available online. The main risks include copyright status, personal and sensitive information, potential harm for stressful consent, and etc. So the green strokes represent continuous uh, the continuous um, the differences of uh, the third part copyright that we we have of collections uh, where copyright of is the third part holders. Uh, and external to LSE. These collections were donated and acquired by LSE Library, but their authors are still the copyright holders. Now, these collections are a very low risk or not commercial, per were not created for com commercial purposes. Uh, so it's good to mention that as well. Uh, so the variation green tones express the nuances with this in copyright um, because it's not really black and white is it the orange strokes represent in copyright collections owned by, by LSE the blue strokes are material that are out of copyright sometimes referred in the public domain the gray strokes are the gray areas and so on I think you get an idea here the symbols represent the mechanisms we have to signpost risks and the caveats for the reuse of digital assets to the public. We are digitizing and acquiring more digital assets that technically are in copyright, and so we have to take a managed risk approach to make them available online. And having identified the risks, we then consulted with the LSC risk manager. He advised us to, the, in the big scheme of things uh, at LSC, for LSC, risks associating publishing in copyright material is very low. So we got to his go ahead to take risks and, though, and so we make things available online, but we use things like Creative Commons license, the right statements, uh, as well as inform the, the user via pages uh, on sensitive information, information potential harmful content, and use of takedown policy. But going back to the other capabilities, um, the digital assets are actually very complex entities. Uh, their long-term preservation requires good digital preservation capabilities, particularly with bitstream preservation, content preservation, and metadata management. Bitstream preservation is extremely important as it provides assurance that files will be rendered in the future and we won't have loss of content or corruption of files, deletion, or files going amiss. Them systems that provide digital pre preservation function, functions, we have the digital assets with their metadata and preserve or normalize the digital files at bit level for you. I get asked a lot if backup is not enough. Um, we backup material is not enough for us. Do we need a digital preservation system with DP? Uh, to you know to do that for us and I say this it's a metaphor okay a few years ago I have two wonderful um, dresses number two um, that I really liked it I really liked the first got another one just in case I wanted to use again uh, they are there in my wardrobe but you know what they don't fit my after maternity body anymore. So I have two copies, they are there. I can look at them, but I can't use. So you may have a different metaphor, maybe perhaps a better one, but I'm telling you every time I use this, people will get the point that backing up, having two copies somewhere, it's not enough. 
Um, and there are so many reasons for that, and I'm not going to delve into this today. But if you want to really to make your things really accessible in 50 years, um, you need you need to think about the DP. And that is my case. That's the audience I need. That's my need, our LSE library, let's say. So, um, so let me address the elephant in the room, I think, uh, from my perspective. Why digital preservation should be in the digital asset manager agenda? I think there's all of this that is in these slides, you know, company brand and history and identity, public engagement or outreach. I'm sure you have other reasons uh, to do that. Um, and some of the, some of our companies have archive services or records management or a library, and they will probably look after this. They're going to, you know, take care of that. But not everyone has uh, has archives or archivists in place. So you are the person. You are digital asset manager. Are the person? To, you are the person to think. Um, to think about these things. If nothing else, think about the business continu continuity, please. These are pressing times. And, um, and, and you know, with like the pandemic throw so much, this, uh, so much um, disruption into our lives. Um, or let's think about change of management. Um, think about Twitter the Twitter uh, organization, that's what's going on there. Or resources are slashed. Um, so having the assets well managed will minimize disruption and improve business continuity in those scenarios. And for some of you, digital preservation is really, uh, it should be available to you. And obviously none of these capabilities I was talking about um, are created or improved overnight, uh, but over a period of time, one can target a few capabilities to tackle one. Uh, and I think some, some previous uh, speakers talked about that too. Uh, at the moment, the LSE was in a very high level of digital preservation and, and digital asset governance maturity, uh, but you know, it wasn't it was an overnight work. So I'm coming to an end to my uh, presentation, um, and I th I thought I would give some top tips from what what I do, what I have been doing, uh, what is happening at LSC Library. Um, uh, that I probably is is the top things I would. Um, talk to people if they ask me what is are their top tips to manage well a good uh, you know well enough uh, digital uh, housekeeping as I was saying so my first tip is vision so create a vision for what's good governance for you and your organization um, and embed it in the heart of the company uh, digital asset management is not done by one person or one team and it's usually a cross team uh, responsibility with everyone having a common understanding. The second one is investing our people, uh, investing the people uh, managing uh, your assets. And I think most of us are digital assets manager. He is really going to relate to this. Uh, you need to be trained, you need to be on the loop, you need to be looking for what is next. Um, don't sit in what, what just the skills you have and bring the people with you on this. Um, don't let them sit down and just enjoy their daily work. They need to be developing their professional skills too. Uh, the other tip is have a digital asset register in place. Um, this could be in the form of a spreadsheet, a database in your dams, a combination of sorts. Um, it could be a basic inventory or a data-driven register. Um, it's really for your own benefit. No need to share with others. It's for you. Uh, but what, in, what, the, what it, if it's well done, it really helps you to show results of your work, to return of investment, uh, to aid you to create a narrative of success at a fingertip 
and, and to seek further resources. So have one, digital asset register. Have a digital preservation or a digital asset management system with digital preservation functionalities. Um, I think I've, I've said, um, the, you know, the, the digital files can go amiss. You know, they are very fragile and having that sort of functionality for you will help you to maintain these files alive uh, for a long time. And scale, think about your scale. You don't need to preserve everything. You don't need to archive everything. You don't need to keep everything. Um, I, I usually say archivists are archivists. They're not ho hoarders. <laughs> and so are digital assets managers. You need to appraise. Not everything your organization creates is worth keeping for a long period. Uh, so, you know, work on 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 what to what to maintain, what to collect, and what to keep. And my last thing is the easy access. Um, um, you know, digital assets should be easy to access by everyone in your organization. And uh, if it's not easy to access, bear in mind restrictions, uh, permissions. You know, this needs to be in place, of course. Easy access doesn't mean open access internally. Um, but if digital assets um, are not easy to access either via a gatekeeper or not, uh, you need to think about how best to open up it. And I think that's it for me. Um, any questions? Great, thank you, Fabiana. Yes, we do have some questions. Um, I also have some questions, um, which if we have time, I will ask you later on. Um, first question, how do you balance long term against short term when it comes to governance? Do you have any overarching thoughts on that? Um, yes, so I think, you know, when we create a digital asset, not necessarily they are available easily. Uh, um, it, it, or integrate to a digital library, for example, but we have other forms of ways to disseminate it if we need. Um, so I think it's uh, uh, making it accessible via our digital library, uh, it's much more, it requires some more work sometimes and we can make things available, but it depends what's the platform, what's the need and who is asking. Okay, great. Um, you were also talking about Bitstream and personally, I was a bit unsure about this. I know you came back and, and touched on the subject once again. Um, and somebody's just asked for clarification, their understanding being, <clears throat> excuse me, that Bitstream preservation refers to the integrity and quality of the digital file over time. Would you have a moment to just expand on that with your experience at LSE and, and what we, sh we should be thinking about when it comes to Bitstream preservation? Yeah, so bitstream preservation is when you you keep files, um, digital files, you know, imagine videos, multimedia, PDFs, uh, in, 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 integral, uh, keep them well. Uh, oh my God, I don't have the right technical terms to say, but think, um, imagine that 20 years ago, there are files formats that we can't access anymore because uh, either we don't have the right systems anymore or they they weren't preserved, they were the, they, we can't render them. So that's what I'm talking about. So don't worry about your Word document because Microsoft will keep maintaining it, but not necessarily we keep um, for uh, digital files that uh, can, be, can be accessed, used and reused. Um, so it's more like the technical aspects of the file. So I'm afraid I don't have like a, a, the right technical terms, but if you come to me um, and, uh, and contact me, I can probably direct you to some more uh, information on this. Yes, that would be great. I suppose it's a bit like if you have an old version of Illustrator or um, Photoshop and then you try and open a, a more recent file, um, 
you know, you are to some extent tied into subscriptions with those service providers to ensure that you always have the most updated version. But that, of course, is not the case uh, with your dam system, although I'm sure some dam vendors do think about that and do kind of make allowances for that. Um, but yeah, just keeping an eye on any more questions that people might have before we, it will be time to, to end today's um, event. Um, so Fabiani, you were talking about good enough, and I think I'm a big fan of this, you know, the kind of good enough approach to get the right conditions to find, um, to allow people to find the right assets. So are we pretty much in agreement then? There is no such thing as perfection. It's about trying to do the best we can in as many instances as possible for as many users as possible. Um, we can't please all of the people all of the time. Is this something that keeps you awake at night or as an archivist, are you kind of, you know, used to working in this way? And what advice do you have for people who are looking for perfection, um, given the fact that sometimes good enough is, is better than, than doing nothing? Yes, no, good enough is better than nothing, to be honest. And even the basic is better than nothing. Uh, sometimes I think, it, you know, uh, we get to a new job and you see legacy collections, legacy work. People put a lot of effort in one collection, in one part of the work. And it's, it's, it can be beautiful, but everything else is, is lagging. Um, I prefer to bring everything at the basic level. Um, so good enough doesn't keep me awake at night. Um, I think that we can sometimes put more effort in certain areas than others, in certain collections than others. Um, not, but perfection is not good. Um, uh, but I think perf I think this is not even perfection. It's like let's talk about metadata. You know why create. Um, having a database with 25 fields, if you can have a good enough with 15 and populate those consistent. So I think that is that is the, um, you know, think about the mandatory fields in, in, your, in your catalogs or your digital asset management uh, areas that you need to populate. Perhaps you don't need a lot of fields, you need less, but be consistent. Um, I, th I think really that's the point. sort of approach, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, that, that does tie in so well with metadata because what we often find is, you know, having more isn't better. In fact, having yeah. less is often better um, yeah. in terms of, you know, making sure that it's as relevant as it can be. And of course, we've got tools at our disposal within uh, the system that we use to ensure that, you know, you talked about the language people people speak um, to ensure that we can kind of cater for all those different terms that people might be putting into a search database we need to use a simple um, presentation of that but maybe have the complexity hidden behind the scenes I mean at least that in my experience is what I would want a digital asset management system to provide um, so yeah just on that theme you were talking about um, all the different types of assets that you actually manage there at LSE. Um, so you're digitizing leaflets, documents, tapes. Are these cassette tapes, audio files, as well as photographs? Um, yes, at the moment, we're actually doing, um, we, we are planning a open reel um, interview, uh, interview open reel tapes that we uh, did the, did the Women's Library uh, did an oral history interviewed suffragists and suffragists um, and we are re-digitizing the reels because in the past those reels were copied to you know talking about backups talk uh, they were uh, copied to cassette tapes and those cassette tapes were digitized about 15 years ago the digitization from the from the cassette tapes were were not good enough so we're going back to the original the real uh, the open real digitization has become more accessible i wouldn't say necessarily cheap but cheaper um and and so we have the resources to go back and re-digitize the original tapes um we also have some vhs tapes in the past about five years ago we digitized the lsc public lectures a collection. Um, it was, you know, in a corner of the archives, and we have, you know, presentations from a Clinton uh, and or public lectures from Clinton or uh, Mandela. You know, so many very high uh, uh, profile public. Um, 
that, that those are tapes. These are externally done uh, with external uh, digitization providers. Uh, LSC has launched a digitization uh, in-house uh, su suite, but is you know it's it's just, it's just two stations, uh, more for textual and image, um, uh, but not not um, uh, tapes or anything like that. Could you just tell us something about the user experience or the interface that people would come to, you know, as opposed to being a general public uh, user or a, an expert or a specialist in a, in a certain field of economics? Do they receive a different um, version of your archive? Do they, are they going into different areas and is the taxonomy different for each of those user types? Oh, Clemens, I wish it was. <laughs> I wish we were that, that developed. Um, so the digital library gives, let's say, a flavor of what we have, uh, to be quite honest. But some of collections we have, like the economic history, it's that is a lot of table. It's, it's, it's a statistical collection um, and we digitize up to, to the 90s. Um, and we convert, so we provide in the digital library the PDFs, uh, so the images the, the user can see, but we can also provide via the by request text files or XML files. And the text files is for to help them to then uh, text mining or format shift the tabular data that is in, it is in there to their, you know, to, to CSV files and, and and use the data in the way they prefer. Um, I think that's one of the areas that we're going to start doing more. Um, but we realize that if we try to mass transform tabular tabular um, content to CSV with the technology that is available to us, um, the tables come very dirty, very messy and it doesn't help either but if we convert the the image to text files and then the researchers take the text files and use with 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 themselves it's probably they'll be better off at the moment technology is really improving in this area um, so hopefully in a few years we can actually i can you know say that we provide up up front um the tables in, in CSV files or any other uh, format that is, is going to be relevant. Um, the digital library is, is supported by a platform that is not very user friendly and we cannot compete with Google or Flickr or any of other um, more modern platforms. The, the, the feedback we get is that it could be better uh, in terms of navigation, uh, but at the same time, we are able to put so much things online now, so so much quicker than we used to, that our our community is just grateful that we digitize and put it online. Um, and with that, for example, uh, a few years ago, we digitized the census, the South African census and educational reports. Um, you, you uh, it's digitized, it's not made available uh, because it was part of a commission with an internal department. It was sitting, you know, on under my table, I was there. But um, last year I've been contacted by the South Cape, uh, Cape Town, sorry, Cape Town uh, University, who was, you, you may have followed that the, the, their library was burned out or part of it. And they lost access to their copies of this. Um, I'm not sure if they lost it completely, totally, uh, completely damaged, but they asked us if you could make it available online. So their community in South Africa can actually access them. So their community, in whatever format you do, even is very clunky, they are so grateful. Um, yeah, of but, course. I mean, it is, it's just about making progress ultimately and, yes. you know, good, good good enough and and doing what we can so thank you so much I'm, I'm sorry to have to cut you a little bit short because that's really interesting um 
experience that you were sharing with us there, Fabiana, but I just have a couple of um, comments that I need to share with everybody who's joined us today, um, if I may. So thank you once again for your interesting presentation on the LSE archives. I'd really like to look up some of the resources that you shared with us, um, as well as dig a little bit deeper into the assets themselves that sound absolutely fascinating. Um, so just to say thank you to everybody for attending Damfest Europe 2023. Um, just a reminder that the recordings are made available in the agenda tab. Uh, Henry Stewart would love to hear your thoughts and feedback on your event experience. If you could just take a moment to complete the post event survey, the link for that is in the community tab. Um, we're very excited about some further upcoming events this year, including DAM Los Angeles, which is in March, and of course DAM in uh, London, DAM Europe in June. Also DAM New York in September, so three big in-person live events for you to look forward to this year, and we hope that we'll see some of you throughout the year at these events. Um, you can check out the Henry Stewart website for further information and take advantage of their early bird offer. So once again, thanks to everybody for joining us today, today for all of the sponsors, uh, the speakers, the presenters, the vendors um, for such a great event. We look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you so much for your time. Bye bye.